Hey everybody, welcome to homerecordingmadeeasy.com and here on my YouTube channel and in this video we're going to talk about 10 tips to help you make better mixes in your home studio. These are 10 tips that are tried and true, don't cost any money or very little money and will absolutely help you make bring your mixes to the next level. But before we get to that, if you like what you see on this channel, please hit that subscribe button. Also, head over to Facebook, facebook.com slash homerecordingmadeeasy and follow me on Facebook as I'm always posting content on Facebook that's not part of this YouTube channel. And for more tips, tricks, concepts, and training around all aspects of home recording, mixing, and mastering, be sure to head out to homerecordingmadeeasy.com and check out the Quick Mix series and the Made Easy series as they will help you bring your mixes to the next level, I promise. So let's get to these 10 tips to help you make better mixes in your home studio. Tip number one, mixing at low volumes. Now I talk about this a lot on my YouTube channel. It's a really good idea that you mix at very low volumes to be able to do some critical listening to get to, to, uh, to ensure that you can hear all your instrumentation, everything is clear and everything is panned to the right spots in the stereo field, et cetera, et cetera. Mixing at high volume levels doesn't really do you any good for a couple of reasons. One, you're easily going to get ear fatigue. And what that means is as you listen to loud music over about 80, 90 dB for any length of time, your ears are going to naturally start to close and compress themselves to protect your hearing. And therefore, you're not going to get an accurate picture, especially of the upper mid range and high end of your mix. Everything is going to start to sound a little bit duller and you're going to compensate with your EQ, making things brighter and brighter. And then when you come back and checks with a fresh set of ears, you're going to realize that your mixes are way too bright. So mixing at low volumes is going to save your ears. It's going to protect your hearing. And it's also going to give you an opportunity to listen very, very critically to make sure that you can hear all your instrumentation. So when you mix at low volumes and you get your mix to sound balanced, and you get things to sound clear with great clarity as you bring the volume up it's just going to open itself up and the mixes are going to translate much better now how low you should mix at what volume level should it be well there's everyone's a little different what I try to do is I try to mix at volume levels where if you were sitting next to me in my control room we can still have a conversation and kind of have the mixes or the mix playing back in the studio at a relatively comfortable level or you can also uh, you know if you're kind of tapping on your keyboard or kind of typing on your keyboard you should be able to hear the keys uh, typing while the music is kind of playing back that's kind of a good starting point usually around 60 dB maybe 65 dB that's a good place to start you can get a free uh, dB meter for your smartphone and you can just kind of put it in your seated position turn up your volume start at around 50 db between 50 and 60 or again where you can sit and have a conversation that is typically low enough tip number two using reference tracks uh, is a great way for you to ensure that your mixes are going to translate well outside of your control room in your home studio. So I do this an awful lot. I use professionally recorded tracks uh, that we all know and love that are similar to the style of music that I might be mixing. And I like to constantly be A, being my mix against a professionally recorded and mixed track to ensure that from an EQ perspective, things sound about the same. So for example, if you're mixing a country tune, for example, you would use maybe a couple of country tracks that are professionally recorded that are on the radio uh, that are mixed and mastered by professional audio engineers comparing my country track to those tracks I can uh, get a feel for how loud should the drums be how loud should the bass be where does the vocal sit does it sit on top of the mix Does it sit a little bit below the mix what is the overall EQ perspective of my mix versus a professionally commercial release recording that is an excellent way to kind of make sure that you're headed on the right track to make sure your mix can compete the other thing you can do is you can use um, a couple of plugins, one by a sample magic called Magic AB. Uh, that is a great plugin for you to be able to load uh, reference tracks into a plugin and easily be able to AB your mix against the commercially released recording real quick and easy, down and dirty, simple to use, easy to set up. Another plugin you may want to check is by Audified called the Mix Checker. The Mix Checker is a great plugin for you to check your mix on simulated different listening environments. So Audified Mix Checker has, uh, I think, 12 different um, simulations of different listening environments, such as a laptop, such as a car stereo system, a smartphone, a tablet, etc., etc. And by using that plugin Mix Checker, you can compare your mix to Mix Checker check it on different listening environments and make sure that when you get out of your control room your mix is going to sound good on a wide variety 
of, of different stereo systems. So using reference tracks and checking your mix in different environments, whether you take it and bring it to the car or bring it to your other computer or bring it to your iPhone and listen to it on earbuds or whether you use a plugin like Mix Checker is a great way to make sure your mixes will stand up to commercially released recordings. Tip number three is something really simple that a lot of us engineers kind of just forget about because we get so uh, enthralled in what we're doing and we get so into what we're doing, we forget to do something really simple, which is take breaks. Taking breaks every 30 to 45 minutes, an hour at most, gives your ears a chance to rest. It gives your ears a chance to reset. So when you come back and listen to your mix, you can get that first impression or first perspective again and it'll also over time allow you to mix longer uh, in time intervals because your ears are going to be rested so taking breaks is super super important how long should your breaks be maybe 10 to 15 minutes where you're working for an hour go outside get a cup of coffee get a breath of fresh air get something to eat let your ears kind of uh, come down and kind of uh, uh, decompress a little bit and then come back in and listen to the mix uh, with a fresh set of ears and that's instantly going to stand out what in the mix if anything needs to be changed or adjusted so taking breaks is in a super super effective way to make sure that as you're moving through a mix your mix is going to kind of stay on track so you don't don't get way out in left field. So taking breaks is super important. Tip number four is another uh, one of these things that a lot of engineers don't think about, but I've talked about it a lot on my YouTube channel, and that is checking your mix in mono. Now this is a great way. Uh, now most people today will listen to things in stereo. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, uh, mono stereo systems, if you will, these days, but checking your mix in mono is important because when you check, when you fold your mix down to mono, you're gonna have all the instruments are gonna kind of come to the middle, and it gives you a really good indication of whether or not, again, from an EQ perspective, that you can hear everything. Everything is well balanced and everything is kind of clear. The other thing is, depending on where the track or the music you're mixing is going to be, where its final destination is out in the world, there are still areas where you're going to, you may hear this thing coming in through a mono uh, stereo system. For example, if you're walking through a department store and you hear the music over the overhead speakers, those are typically a mono. Uh, if you're in an elevator and you're listening to music in the elevator, that's typically a mono. Now that's, uh, you know, rare in most of your mix Mixes. most people watching this your mixes may not be played in those environments but it's a good idea to just kind of check your mix and mono make sure that you don't lose any of the instrumentation especially the bass guitar and the kick drum uh, make sure those things are coming right up the middle and when your guitars if you have guitars in your track if they're panned hard left and right in the stereo field when you bring it to mono it's going to come in towards the middle and you want to make sure that you can hear those guitars uh, when they play with the kick and the snare and the, and the bass guitar and the vocal so checking your mix in mono most DAWs have a simple button on the master fader to let you fold your mix into mono there's other plugins and such that you can put on uh, your master bus depending on your DAW that'll let you check your mix in mono and sometimes your audio interfaces these days will have a mono button on them as well. So checking your mix in mono, again, is just another way to ensure that no matter where your, system, where your song is going to be played, that you're going to be able to hear everything and it's going to be balanced with some clarity. So check your mixes in mono. Tip number five is something that a lot of engineers and a lot of us home studio guys, myself included, have a hard time resisting. And this is a good thing to keep in your back of your mind. And I call it keep it simple. The fewer plugins, the better. And what I mean by that is a lot of times I'll have students send me mixes that they've been working on. I'll open up the session and there will be a gazillion plugins uh, on, their, on their mix. They'll have, uh, for example, uh, a kick drum and they'll have, uh, you know, three EQs and two compressors and stacking compressors and doing side chains and all this crazy stuff. And what ends up happening over time when you do that accumulative throughout all your tracks is everything can tend to be a big mess. I like to keep things very, very simple. We want to do things with uh, with the minimal and the fewest amount of plugins possible now there's going to be times and there's going to be uh, sessions you're going to get into your studio where there's some things that weren't recorded very well and you're going to have to do some surgery to get these tracks to sound good and I totally understand that but you always want to go into the mix trying to use as few plugins as possible and I know that's not a popular thing because plugins are cool and we all love plugins and we like the sexy GUIs and all that stuff but at the end of the day putting too many plugins on your mix sometimes can do a lot more harm than it could do good. So always keep in the back of your mind to try to use the fewest amount of plugins as you humanly can and that is going to help you make your mix sound more balanced and from again from an EQ perspective most importantly you're going to have a lot more clarity, you're going to have a lot more of an open sound when you don't jumble it up with too many plugins. So keep it simple. Tip number six is another simple tip that doesn't cost you anything and it's called limit your time mixing. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is 
One of the problems with digital recording and all these great plugins and all the cool things that we can do in digital, the, uh, the possibilities are endless, right? So what I try to do when I'm mixing a song, a typical song that may have between say 15 tracks and say 30 tracks, 32 tracks, is I wanna limit the amount of time it's gonna take me to kind of mix this song. So what I do is I set a timer on my, on my smartphone and I say I'm gonna give myself three hours to mix the track, for example. After I've done all of my editing, after I set up my session, after I've organized everything and it's time to start mixing, I try to limit my mixes to about two to three hours. Now again, sometimes it may require that you go longer, sometimes you may be able to finish up a little less. But by limiting your time and limiting your options, it keeps you from overcooking the mix, so to speak. You have to know when to stop. You have to know when a mix is good enough. And in the digital realm, it's real easy to fall into the trap where you could constantly be adding and adding and adding things to it to kind of keep changing things along the way. And again, you end up going down a rabbit trail where end up the mix ends up being worse than if you were to just back off again, keep it simple like in my last tip. So a good way to do that is to limit yourself. Give yourself a time limit. Start yourself with say two hours. Say I'm gonna mix this song in two hours. Get in there, get a workflow, get a template set up so your workflow is speedy and just uh, you know keep it simple move through the tracks don't spend way too much time listening to things don't overthink things too much and see where you are at the end of that two hours now you may need a little more you might finish up a little less but again limitations limiting your time more times than not is going to help you achieve a better mix because your first impressions your first go at it is usually one of the better ones the longer you work on a mix a lot of times the worse it gets. And again, I know that's a generalization, but try it. Limit your time, limit the time that you spend mixing a song. Tip number seven is another one that I talk about with all of my students, especially the newbies. Don't overuse compression. Understand why you're using compression. The number one telltale sign that I, that I hear when I get a mix in from someone who's new or one of my students that's kind of learning, and we all have done this, I've done this for years, so don't feel bad about what I'm about to say, is the use of over compression, using compression too much. A lot of people think because we have a compressor that we have to compress every single track and we got to squash it to death because we watched one of our famous uh, engineers out on YouTube and they put a ton of compression and they squashed the hell out of all the tracks so we think that's what we're supposed to do. Compression can be your best friend and it can be your worst enemy and it is also probably the one of the most uh, misunderstood tools as a mixing engineer that we have. And I urge you to go out and really understand what compression is, when you should use compression, and why you should use compression. There are a ton of online tutorials, also on homerecordingmadeeasy.com. Compression Made Easy is a product that I created just for this purpose, to teach the newbie who has trouble understanding compression or doesn't know how to listen to compression, what compression is, when to use it, and how to use it effectively. Don't over compress your tracks. Understand why you're compressing and don't just slap a compressor on every single track because you think you're supposed to. A lot of times tracks don't need any compression or they need very light compression. So understanding compression and don't over compress will help your mix in the end not sound too muddy and too squished. Your mix will sound more open, have a lot more dynamics, have a lot more life and a lot more feel to them when you, you, when you use compression effectively. Tip number eight is something that will help you really, uh, again, kind of recalibrate your ears and recalibrate your brain. And that is before you print the final mix, before you think you're done, the best thing you can do is shut off your computer screen and stop looking at the DAW and listen. One of the things about digital, again, it's a great medium to be in and we are so fortunate to have DAWs and all this uh, digital technology. It is a wonderful thing. But one of the problems is we get so sucked into the computer screen and we look at all the fancy plugins and all the audio waveforms and we end up mixing with our eyes and not our ears. So whenever I'm about to print a final mix for a client uh, or some of my own music, the last thing I do is I shut off my computer screen, I dim the lights in my studio and I just sit and I don't touch the mouse, I don't touch the keyboard, I don't touch any hardware and listen with a pen and a pad and take some notes on what you're hearing. Listen for things like, can I hear all the instrumentation? Does everything sound well balanced? Can I focus and listen? Can I pick out each instrument in the mix and can I hear it clearly? Take notes and then when you're done listening to the song from top to bottom, listen to the entire song, then go back, 
turn on the computer screen and make changes. It's a great way to kind of get your, your eyes and your brain and your ears to kind of just recalibrate itself and go, we're listening to the music. Because remember, the person that's going to be listening to your mix in the end is not looking at it in the DAW. They're listening to it on a set of headphones, earbuds, on their, on their, uh, in their car, or wherever they're going to be listening to it. They're not, they're not uh, listening with their eyes, they're listening with their ears. So a really good tip again, shut off that computer screen before you print that final mix. And trust me, this will help you achieve a better mix. Okay, tip number nine is another thing that's obvious that again, it's probably one of the least sexy things in our home studio. And it's one of the things that most newbies and beginners overlook. And I know you've heard this before and you've heard it on my channel and I'm gonna say it again, acoustic treatment. Basic acoustic treatment in your mixing environment is gonna go a long way to helping you achieve a better mix. The reason for this is more times than not, when you take a mix that sounds really great in your mixing environment and you take it outside of your mixing environment and you put it in your car or in your computer or on your iPhone or on your Android or wherever you're listening to that mix in and it doesn't sound the same, it's because the room that you were mixing in isn't telling you the truth about what's going on in that mix and you're comp compensating with EQ mostly to try to make up for the problems in the room. The best way to combat that is using acoustic treatment. Now you don't need to spend a ton of money on acoustic treatment. For a few hundred dollars, and if you don't have uh, the budget even to spend that, you can make a lot of your acoustic treatment very, very easily. Just do a Google search or search on YouTube. There are thousands of videos on how to make your own bass traps, how to uh, acoustically treat your room. There's even some stuff on my channel at Home Recording Made Easy. But acoustic treatment is gonna help you be able to hear what's coming out of your studio speakers more accurately so you can use EQ and compression so it gives you a realistic uh, picture of what's going on in the mix. So again, it's not a fancy plug and it's not a fancy piece of gear, but it is probably one of the most important things you can possibly do. Before you buy any plugins, before you buy any hardware, you spend some money on acoustic treatment and you'll thank me later because your mixes will translate much, much better from your control room out into the real world. Tip number 10, again, is probably the most important thing uh, and I put this last for a reason because it is probably one of the more important things and if you want a better mix have a better recording capturing raw tracks is the most important thing you can possibly do to make sure that your mix is a better mix so if you are the recording uh, engineer or musician recording the tracks take the time to record well recorded raw tracks don't wait and fix it in the mix. I know you've heard that a million times before. Fixing in the mix is not the answer to a better mix. Recording well-recorded raw tracks is the, is the secret to a great mix. Now, if you're a mixing engineer and you didn't record the session, well, this tip really doesn't apply to you. But a lot of people that are watching this video, you record your own music, you record your own tracks, right? Make sure, take the time, educate yourself on how to, for example, record an acoustic drum kit, like the one sitting over my shoulder here. If you're recording drums in your home studio, take the time, get good mic placement, get good drum sounds, record them well on the way in. Same thing with all the other instrumentation, because when you get to mixing, when you first put up those faders in your DAW and you're listening to the raw tracks with no plugins, it'll already start to sound like kind of a finished mix. If you have that, then your mix is going to turn out great as long as you don't jumble it up when you're throwing all these extra plugins on it like we talked about earlier in this video. So well-recorded tracks, better capture is really, truly 75% of having a great mix. So I hope this video was helpful. Again, for more tips, tricks, concepts, and training around everything home recording, mixing, and mastering, be sure to head out to homerecordingmadeeasy.com. And once again, hit that subscribe button if you like this video. Share it out on your Facebook page. Follow me over at facebook.com slash homerecordingmadeeasy. And until the next video, this has been David with homerecordingmadeeasy.com, and I will speak to you all soon. Take care.